Chapter Nine of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Nine, An Evening in the Country. Monsieur Guerin's Dido, a charming sketch. Strombeck. His expression was singular when he saw Madame de Renal the next day. He watched her like an enemy with whom he would have to fight a duel. These looks, which were so different from those of the previous evening, made Madame de Renal lose her head. She had been kind to him, and he appeared angry. She could not take her eyes off his. Madame Derville's presence allowed Julien to devote less time to conversation and more time to thinking about what he had in his mind. His one object all this day was to fortify himself by reading the inspired book that gave strength to his soul. He considerably curtailed the children's lessons, and when Madame de Renal's presence had effectually brought him back to the pursuit of his ambition, he decided that she absolutely must allow her hand to rest in his that evening the setting of the sun which brought the crucial moment nearer and nearer made julien's heart beat in a strange way night came he noticed with a joy which took an immense weight off his heart that it was going to be very dark the sky which was laden with big clouds that had been brought along by a sultry wind seemed to herald a storm the two friends went for their walk very late all they did that night struck julien as strange they were enjoying that hour which seems to give certain refined souls an increased pleasure in loving. At last they sat down, Madame de Renal beside Julien, and Madame Derville near her friend. Engrossed as he was by the attempt which he was going to make, Julien could think of nothing to say. The conversation languished. "'Shall I be as nervous and miserable over my first duel?' said Julien to himself for he was too suspicious, both of himself and of others, not to realise his own mental state. In his mortal anguish he would have preferred any danger whatsoever. How many times did he not wish some matter to crop up which would necessitate Madame de Renal going into the house and leaving the garden? The violent strain on Julien's nerves was too great for his voice not to be considerably changed. Soon Madame de Renal's voice became nervous as well, but Julien did not notice it. The awful battle raging between duty and timidity was too painful for him to be in position to observe anything outside himself. A quarter to ten had just struck on the chateau clock without his having ventured anything. Julien was indignant at his own cowardice and said to himself, At the exact moment when ten o'clock strikes, I will perform what I have resolved to do all through the day, or I will go up to my room and blow out my brains. After a final moment of expectation and anxiety, during which Julien was rendered almost beside himself by his excessive emotion, ten o'clock struck from the clock over his head. Each stroke of the fatal clock reverberated in his bosom, and caused an almost physical pang. Finally, when the last stroke of ten was still reverberating, he stretched out his hand and took Madame de Renal's, who immediately withdrew it. Julien, scarcely knowing what he was doing, seized it again. In spite of his own excitement, he could not help being struck by the icy coldness of the hand which he was taking. He pressed it convulsively. A last effort was made to take it away, but in the end the hand remained in his. His soul was inundated with happiness. Not that he loved Madame de Renal, but an awful torture had just ended. He thought it necessary to say something, to avoid Madame Derville noticing anything. His voice was now strong and ringing. Madame de Renal's, on the contrary, betrayed so much emotion that her friend thought she was ill, and suggested her going in. Julien scented danger. If Madame de Renal goes back to the salon, I shall relapse into the awful state in which I have been all day. I have held the hand far too short a time for it really to count as the scoring of an actual advantage. At the moment when Madame Derville was repeating her suggestion to go back to the salon, Julien squeezed vigorously the hand that was abandoned to him. 
Madame de Renal, who had started to get up, sat down again and said in a faint voice, I feel a little ill, as a matter of fact, but the open air is doing me good. These words confirmed to Julien's happiness, which at the present moment was extreme. He spoke, he forgot to pose, and appeared the most charming man in the world to the two friends who were listening to him. Nevertheless, there was a slight lack of courage in all this eloquence which had suddenly come upon him. He was mortally afraid that Madame Derville would get tired of the wind before the storm, which was beginning to rise, and want to go back alone into the salon. He would then have remained tête-à-tête -tête with Madame de Renal. He had had, almost by accident, that blind courage which is sufficient for action, but he felt that it was out of his power to speak the simplest word to Madame de Renal. He was certain that, however slight her reproaches might be, he would nevertheless be worsted, and that the advantage he had just won would be destroyed. Luckily for him on this evening, his moving and emphatic speeches found favour with Madame Derville, who very often found him as clumsy as a child and not at all amusing. As for Madame de Renal, with her hand in Julien's, she did not have a thought. She simply allowed herself to go on living. The hour spent under this great pine tree, planted by Charles the Bold, according to the local tradition, were a real period of happiness. She listened with delight to the soughing of the wind in the thick foliage of the pine tree, and to the noise of some stray drops which were beginning to fall upon the leaves which were lowest down. Julien failed to notice one circumstance which, if he had, would have quickly reassured him. Madame de Renal, who had been obliged to take away her hand, because she had got up to help her cousin to pick up a flower-pot which the wind had knocked over at her feet, had scarcely sat down again before she gave him her hand with scarcely any difficulty, and as though it had already been a prearranged thing between them. Midnight had struck a long time ago. It was at last necessary to leave the garden. They separated. Madame de Renal swept away as she was, by the happiness of loving, was so completely ignorant of the world that she scarcely reproached herself at all. Her happiness deprived her of her sleep. A leaden sleep overwhelmed Julien, who was mortally fatigued by the battle which timidity and pride had waged in his heart all through the day. He was called at five o'clock on the following day, and scarcely gave Madame de Renal a single thought. He had accomplished his duty, and a heroic duty too. The consciousness of this filled him with happiness. He locked himself in his room, and abandoned himself with quite a new pleasure to reading the exploits of his hero. When the breakfast bell sounded, the reading of the bulletins of the great army had made him forget all his advantages of the previous day. He said to himself flippantly as he went down to the salon, I must tell that woman that I am in love with her. Instead of those looks brimful of pleasure which he was expecting to meet, he found the stern visage of Monsieur de Renal, who had arrived from Verrier two hours ago and did not conceal his dissatisfaction at Julien's having passed the whole morning without attending to the children. Nothing could have been more sordid than this self-important man when he was in a bad temper, and thought that he could safely show it. Each harsh word of her husband pierced Madame de Renal's heart. As for Julien, he was so plunged in his ecstasy, and still so engrossed by the great events which had been passing before his eyes for several hours, that he had some difficulty at first in bringing his attention sufficiently down to listen to the harsh remarks which M. de Renal was addressing to him. He said to him at last, rather abruptly, I was ill. The tone of this answer would have stung a much less sensitive man than the mayor of Verrieres. He half thought of answering Julien by turning him out of the house straight away. He was only restrained by the maxim which he had prescribed for himself of never hurrying unduly in business matters. The young fool, he said to himself shortly afterwards, has won a kind of reputation in my house. That man Vellano may take him into his family, or he may quite well marry Elisa, and in either case he will be able to have the laugh of me in his heart. In spite of the wisdom of these reflections, Monsieur de Renal's dissatisfaction did not fail to vent itself any the less by a string of coarse insults which gradually irritated Julien. Madame de Renal was on the point of bursting into tears. 
Breakfast was scarcely over when she asked Julien to give her his arm for a walk. She leaned on him affectionately. Julien could only answer all that Madame de Renal said to him by whispering. That's what rich people are like. Monsieur de Renal was walking quite close to them. His presence increased Julien's anger. He suddenly noticed that Madame de Renal was leaning on his arm in a manner which was somewhat marked. This horrified him, and he pushed her violently away and disengaged his arm. Luckily, Monsieur de Renal did not see this new piece of impertinence. It was only noticed by Madame Derville. Her friend burst into tears. Monsieur de Renal now started to chase away, by a shower of stones, a little peasant girl, who had taken a private path crossing a corner of the orchard. Monsieur Julien, restrain yourself, I pray you. Remember that we all have our moments of temper, said Madame Derville rapidly. Julien looked at her coldly, with eyes in which the most supreme contempt was depicted. This look astonished Madame Derville, and it would have surprised her even more if she had appreciated its real expression. She would have read in it something like a vague hope of the most atrocious vengeance. It is, no doubt, such moments of humiliation which have made Robespierre's. "'Your Julien is very violent. He frightens me,' said Madame Derville to her friend in a low voice. "'He is right to be angry,' she answered. What does it matter if he does pass a morning without speaking to the children, after the astonishing progress which he has made them make? One must admit that men are very hard. For the first time in her life Madame de Renal experienced a kind of desire for vengeance against her husband. The extreme hatred of the rich by which Julien was animated was on the point of exploding. Luckily, Monsieur de Renal called his gardener and remained occupied with him in barring, by faggots of thorns, the private road through the orchard. Julien did not vouchsafe any answer to the kindly consideration of which he was the object during all the rest of the walk. Monsieur de Renal had scarcely gone away before the two friends made the excuse of being fatigued, and each asked him for an arm. Walking as he did between these two women, whose extreme nervousness filled their cheeks with a blushing embarrassment, the haughty pallor and sombre, resolute air of Julien formed a strange contrast. He despised these women and all tender sentiments. What, he said to himself, not even an income of five hundred francs to finish my studies? Ah, how I should like to send them packing! And absorbed as he was by these stern ideas, such few courteous words of his two friends as he deigned to take the trouble to understand, displeased him as devoid of sense, silly, feeble, in a word, feminine. As the result of speaking for the sake of speaking, and of endeavouring to keep the conversation alive, it came about that Madame de Renal mentioned that her husband had come from Verrier, because he had made a bargain for the maize straw with one of his farmers. In this district it is the maize straw with which the bed mattresses are filled. My husband will not rejoin us, added Madame de Renal. He will occupy himself with finishing the restuffing of the house mattresses with the help of the gardener and his valet. He has put the maize straw this morning in all the beds on the first story. He is now at the second. Julien changed colour. He looked at Madame de Renal in a singular way, and soon managed somehow to take her on one side, doubling his pace. Madame Derville allowed them to get ahead. Save my life, said Julien to Madame de Renal. Only you can do it, for you know that the valet hates me desperately. I must confess to you, Madame, that I have a portrait. I have hidden it in the mattress of my bed. At these words, Madame de Renal, in her turn, became pale. Only you, Madame, are able, at this moment, to go into my room, feel about without their noticing in the corner of the mattress. It is nearest the window. You will find a small round box of black cardboard, very glossy. Does it contain a portrait? said Madame de Renal, scarcely able to hold herself upright. Julien noticed her air of discouragement, and at once proceeded to exploit it. I have a second favour to ask you, Madame. I entreat you not to look at that portrait. It is my secret. It is a secret, repeated Madame de Renal in a faint voice. 
but though she had been brought up among people who were proud of their fortune and appreciative of nothing except money love had already instilled generosity into her soul truly wounded as she was it was with an air of the most simple devotion that madame de renal asked julien the questions necessary to enable her to fulfil her commission so she said to him as she went away it is a little round box of black cardboard very glossy yes madame answered julien with that hardness which danger gives to men she ascended the second story of the chateau as pale as though she had been going to her death her misery was completed by the sensation that she was on the verge of falling ill but the necessity of doing julien a service restored her strength i must have that box she said to herself as she doubled her pace she heard her husband speaking to the valet in julien's very room happily they passed into the children's room she lifted up the mattress and plunged her hand into the stuffing so violently that she bruised her fingers but though she was very sensitive to slight pain of this kind she was not conscious of it now for she felt almost simultaneously the smooth surface of the cardboard box she seized it and disappeared she had scarcely recovered from the fear of being surprised by her husband than the horror with which this box inspired her came within an ace of positively making her feel ill so julien is in love and i hold here the portrait of the woman whom he loves seated on the chair in the antechamber of his apartment madame de renal fell a prey to all the horrors of jealousy her extreme ignorance moreover was useful to her at this juncture her astonishment mitigated her grief julien seized the box without thanking her or saying a single word and ran into his room where he lit a fire and immediately burnt it he was pale and in a state of collapse he exaggerated the extent of the danger which he had undergone finding napoleon's portrait he said to himself in the possession of a man who professes so great a hate for the usurper found too by a monsieur de renal who is so great an ultra and is now in a state of irritation and to complete my imprudence lines written in my own handwriting on the white cardboard behind the portrait lines too which can leave no doubt on the score of my excessive admiration and each of these transports of love is dated there was one the day before yesterday all my reputation collapsed and shattered in a moment said julien to himself as he watched the box burn and my reputation is my only asset it is all i have to live by and what a life too by heaven an hour afterwards this fatigue together with the pity which he felt for himself made him inclined to be more tender he met madame de renal and took her hand which he kissed with more sincerity than he had ever done before she blushed with happiness and almost simultaneously rebuffed julien with all the anger of jealousy julien's pride which had been so recently wounded made him act foolishly at this juncture he saw in madame de renal nothing but a rich woman he disdainfully let her hand fall and went away he went and walked about meditatively in the garden soon a bitter smile appeared on his lips here i am walking about as serenely as a man who is master of his own time i am not bothering about the children i am exposing myself to monsieur de renal's humiliating remarks and he will be quite right he ran to the children's room the caresses of the youngest child whom he loved very much somewhat calmed his agony he does not despise me yet thought julien but he soon reproached himself for this alleviation of his agony as though it were a new weakness the children caress me just in the same way in which they would caress the young hunting hound which was bought yesterday end of chapter 9 an evening in the country recording by kirsty